Hi, I'm Steph from the Angela Marmon Centre for UK Biodiversity at the Natural History Museum in London. While I'm a specialist in bats and I work in training people about current and future practice in natural history, I have a passion for the history of natural history and where our science has come from. Gilbert's work and legacy has been a huge influence on me throughout my career as an ecologist and as a naturalist. And although I lived in Hampshire for many years, I'm going to be talking to you today about Gilbert's connection to this great city that I live and work in now. The subject of Gilbert's London rarely comes up. June Chatfield wrote about it in 1993 in an issue of London Natural History Society's journal, but that really is about it. Finding connections and references, however, throughout London in Gilbert's journals, books and letters, the, the subject of the links to his place that I now call home fascinate me. I still only feel like I'm really scratching the surface of this so far in my research though. I'd love to hear any links or suggestions that anyone else has got from their own research or their own findings about Gilbert. Please do post them in the comments at the end of this talk or drop me a line separately. I'd love to hear from you because I'm planning on keeping going with this branch of research for some time to come, I hope. But on to my talk. Gilbert's London, my thoughts so far. I'll just share my screen briefly. Okay. Now, we of course know Gilbert's Selborne connection. That is the place that we think of him most often, but he didn't live an entirely sedentary lifestyle. Even though by all accounts he wasn't a huge fan of coach travel, he did visit London several times, and the city was intrinsic to the development of the man, his thoughts and his opportunities, and of course the publication of his book. Much as today, London in the 18th century was a noisy, expanding, crowded, burgeoning city full of diversity, conflict, opportunity, violence, creativity. It suffered from vast wealth disparity and it was thick with ideas. It was a hub of enlightenment thought that had generated wellsprings of new ideas in science throughout society. Not only the wealthy members of the world society that we know so well, but down to the tavern gatherings of groups like the Spitalfields Mathematical Society, which was formed by a group of working class men, mostly weavers, who discussed, shared and taught new ideas in maths, physics and botany. In terms of natural history, advances in technology and changes in ways of thinking about the world around us meant that it was one of Europe's greatest hubs of scientific thought. We might look at some of those ideas now and almost scoff at how obvious they are, but remember, we have access right at our fingertips to information, images, maps, technology, lines of communication, like, for example, online conferences that we're at today. And we are looking at this through the lens of 250 years of advancement in our knowledge of the world, with the advantage of received wisdom from the people of the age that we're talking about. A simple thing to put you in this place in time. Thomas Pennant was asked by Gilbert in one of his letters to be sent a map of Scotland. So Gilbert was aware that there were highlands and islands and lowlands in Scotland. He might have known some of the place names there, but he didn't know what the country looked like, what the shape or outline of it was even. Now, we think of that as obvious. We grow up knowing what the map of the United Kingdom looks like, what the shape of Scotland is. But Gilbert at the time didn't. He didn't have access to that information. In terms of technology, he refers to using the village grocer's scales to weigh his pet tortoise, Timothy. Even that as a piece of scientific equipment wasn't available to him at home. He had to go outside of his home just to get to that. Now, the aggregation of new specimens and objects, both local and from far-flung places, at the time was bringing about new ideas about the world and the wildlife within it. It was bringing new ideas about taxonomy, describing, classifying and naming the natural world had an entirely new impetus. But we must not forget, as we're discussing today, that many of the reasons for these new discoveries were directly connected with colonialism and much was done to profit directly or indirectly from the trade and abuse of enslaved people. Natural history has a checkered past, to say the least. And the creation of these 18th century cabinets of curiosity, which I'll come back to later in my talk, some of them were vast, and some of them included stolen artefacts from occupied and colonized lands, or even if fairly traded or collected, would likely have been brought back to our shores on ships also used for the transport of humans as cargo. 
Some of those collections included human remains and some of them included people abducted from their homes. We don't know what Gilbert's thoughts on this would have been or what his exposure to this circumstance would have been even. His letters, journals focus on his personal interests in natural history, his gardening and his family. He rarely broached his other subjects for the time. Which is, brings us back to our subject for today. What was Gilbert doing in London and what relevance does the city have to today's birthday boy? So this map that you can see now, this is a map of London in 1740. So you can see, you know, it looks broadly familiar, although of course a lot smaller um, and a lot more fields um, and, uh, and in far less of the actual built framework of the city there, but a lot of it is still very familiar to us today. Now Gilbert came to London for his ordination in 1749, but it was most of the presence of his brothers, Thomas and Benjamin, that brought him to the city relatively regularly, particularly for someone who didn't like long travel. While Gilbert, as the older brother, had inherited the wakes in Selborne from their father, Thomas, and this is Thomas White here, Thomas inherited property and wealth from their godfather, Thomas Holt, in 1776. As a result, he changed his name to Thomas Holt White uh, in remembrance of her, their godfather and his benefactor. And in order to make the terms of his inheritance, retired from his wholesale merchant business in Thames Street and moved to South Lambeth. While looking through the Selborne Society's collection of letters from Gilbert White, I stumbled across this on the back of one of Gilbert's letters. You can see all the crossed out and scribbled out bits um, on this scrap of paper. And I don't know about you, but if you look carefully at the top here, you can see there are multiple repetitions of T. Holt White. And I can't help wondering if that was Thomas practicing his signature for his new surname almost. Kind of like to think that it was maybe i'm putting a little bit too much into one sheet of paper there um, but we know relatively little about thomas one thing i have learned from going through the selborne society's letter collection from gilbert is that gilbert was using quite a lot of his brother's paper um, writing on the blank side of sheets that had previously been used by thomas we do know, however, that Thomas was a fellow of the Royal Society and he was a student of natural history himself. Again, on the back of some of Gilbert's letters, there are logs of rainfall from South Lambeth and things like that, which again suggests that's more paper coming from Thomas. And after his inheritance, he was reasonably comfortably well off. Beyond that, he wrote a few things in the Gentleman's Magazine, uh, he's a bit of a literary critic. But we can find glimpses of him and the person he was in Gilbert's letters and journals. Just going to play you one quick quote from Gilbert's uh, journals here. My brother, Thomas White, nailed up several large scallop shells under the eaves of his house at South Lambeth to see if the house martins would build in them. These conveniences had not been fixed half an hour before several pairs settled upon them and expressing great complacency began to build immediately. Now I'm still trying to track down exactly where Thomas's house may have been. There is little left in South Lambeth of his 18th century existence bar one or two buildings and much of the land was fields at the time rather than the cluttered mismatch of buildings we see now. But clues still remain, and I think I have many hours left to go in the Lambeth archives to find where these scallop shells may have been put up. Gilbert refers to South Lambeth many times, and there's just one other that I'm going to play you quickly now. June 29th, 1791, South Lambeth. Some swallows in the district and only two pairs of swifts and no martins. No wonder then that they are overrun with flies which swarm in the summer months and destroy their grapes. Now it's interesting here that Gilbert mentions that there aren't any house martins anymore in Lambeth. And I can report that, that from here today, I can hear swifts still in South Lambeth and I have a pear nesting in the roof of the building that I live in, um, but we don't seem to have house martins anymore. We do seem to have quite a lot of flies, perhaps maybe not as much as Gilbert was uh, complaining about in South Lambeth anymore. Um, but it's interesting that Gilbert noticed this during his visits too. Um, and just to hear those, those sort of personal references of Gilbert when he was in exactly this place where I'm recording this from today uh, is, is really interesting. Now Gilbert seems to have wandered around the local area around Lambeth and its environments a lot when he visited. 
Throughout his journals, we see references like these. I'll just play you a couple more pieces from him. March 14th, 1778. The green woodpecker laughs in the fields of Vauxhall. Owl hoots at Vauxhall. June 3rd, 1788. Haymaking is general about Clapham and South Lambeth. Brother Benjamin has eight acres of hay down and making. Now this of course highlights some of the changes that have happened in this area. There are no longer woodpeckers or owls in Vauxhall and there certainly isn't much in the way of haymaking going on in Clapham either. And I do also wonder if some of Gilbert's inspiration, not just for his natural history, but also from his gardening exploits come from this area. Vauxhall was the market garden essentially of London at the time and again we can see in this map here from about 1740 what the area would have looked like roughly when Gilbert was here. You'll notice there are fields some of them look like they're given over to grass so maybe this is where some of the haymaking was going on but notice all around these areas here all these close-knit patches of what look like rows and rows of market gardens. Now, Robert Steele was a journalist and he took a night boat to Covent Garden in 1712. And as a result of that journey, he wrote the following short passage. I landed with 10 sail of apricot boats at Strand Bridge after having put in at Nine Elms and taken in melons. Now, Nine Elms is just off this map. It's just about here off this map. Unfortunately, it doesn't extend any further than that. Um, so it's right in that heart of the Lambeth Vauxhall area. And the melons that still refers to were grown in specialist pits in Vauxhall, grown alongside other exotics like pineapples and purple sprouting broccoli. Gilbert regularly refers in his letters and his journals to re receiving plants and seeds from South Lambeth, which were sent by his brothers for his garden. But I do wonder if some of his more exotic ideas about growing and gardening, like his melon beds, may have come from his visit to South Lambeth and seeing what was being done here. In terms of natural history collections, this was of course before the Natural History Museum was built. That wasn't to follow, certainly the South Kensington site, until nearly 100 years after the publication of White's book in 1881. There's no reference in Gilbert's journals to either Sir Hans Sloane's collection or the British Museum, which were the starting points of what is now the Natural History Museum. The British Museum had opened in 1759 to all studious and curious persons, and Gilbert, of course, must have been well aware of that collection. But at the time, tickets, although free, had to be requested by application he simply may not have been well con connected enough to request a tour. We know, however, that he visited Sir Lever's collection, and that's what's shown in the image that you can see on the screen now. The Leverian Museum was a very large collection of natural history curiosities. Housed in Leicester House, it was one of the largest collections of the time, and it clearly made an impression on White, as he mentions it several times in his journals. But I do also wonder if there are simply omissions in the journals about visits to other collections. In a note in his journal on the 20th of January, 1793, he writes tantalizingly, Mr. Marsham, who lives near Norwich, writes me word that a servant of his shot a bird last autumn near his house that was quite new to him. Upon examination, it appeared to him and to me to answer the description of the Certhia miraria, the wool creeper, a bird little known but sometimes seen in England. Ray and Willoughby never met with it, nor did I ever find it wild, nor among the vast collections exhibited in London, but Scopoli had a specimen in his museum and says it is to be found in Carniola. Now he says specifically collections, plural. Maybe, just maybe, there were visits to other collections and perhaps the British Museum was among them, but he just doesn't reference it. There are other odd omissions in Gilbert's explorations of London that I find slightly odd. And one of the strange omissions, aside from the British Museum, is the absence of a reference to a visit to the Chelsea Physic Garden. Now, White was well aware of this site. It had existed since 1673, so it certainly wasn't new when he was visiting the city. He had Miller's Garden Dictionary 
Philip Miller was the then head gardener of the Chelsea Physic Garden, and he refers directly to that journal in both Gilbert's own garden calendar and journals and his letters. He even corresponded directly with Miller, and I've read the letters that, that, that again are housed in the Linnaean Society within the Selborne Society's collection. So he surely would have had the opportunity to ask for access if he wanted it. He was also staying reasonably close by, so it would have been fairly accessible when he was in town. It's just on the other side of the river, really, from South Lambeth. Although obviously the bridges weren't there in quite the same way, surely it must still have been accessible. So this remains a mystery to me that I want to delve into further. See what the criteria were maybe for gaining access to the Physic Garden. Now equally, Gilbert stayed on several of his visits in Thames Street. Um, you'll notice on the screen that you can see now, this is the top of one of the letters. This is one of the Selborne Society's letters. And you'll notice there, Thames Street, February the 27th, 1776. And he's writing to one of his brothers. I think this was a letter to John. Um, and this is, this is again the 1740 map, um, just zoomed in a bit. And this here is the Tower of London. And the road that I've marked in orange there, that's Thames Street. So Thames Street was the location of Thomas White's business and presumably his home as well before he moved to South Lambeth. This road, as you can see, leads from the centre of the city towards the tower, right up to the tower, in fact. Now, I don't know where exactly Thomas's business would have been along this road, but a lot of other reports of London at the time talk about being able to hear the roaring of lions, which were in the menagerie, which was housed in the tower. And, you know, being able to hear the noises from many of the other animals in the that were housed in the tower as well. And yet there's no mention of them in his journals or his correspondence. There's only one reference to the presence of swifts roosting in the tower on August the 6th, 1774. Now, of course, the best known London connection, sadly, isn't Thomas, it's Benjamin White. Um, and so Benjamin White was really the most financially successful of the three older White brothers. He moved to London and set up a publishing house at Horace's Head, 51 Fleet Street. Now, this is an interesting location. And we'll just have a look at the map again. So, Fleet Street is here for orientation. This is St Paul's Cathedral over here. The Strand runs down underneath where I put that little note there. And Fleet Street is just this orange section along here. Now, it's a really interesting location. It's really right in the centre of the city. Um, it's right by Temple Bar, as you can see here, that's the old Temple Bar, and this engraving shows Temple Bar in its original location, so you can get an idea of the character of Fleet Street at the time. That's, that engraving was probably from a position, say, around here, I think. Now, it's not always a nice place. It's dirty, noisy, full of people. So very similar to today as, as then. Um, but 18th century Fleet Street was a real hub of people, their thoughts and their ideas. As a bookseller, Benjamin's location was excellent and particularly due to the presence of the Royal Society. So this blue line here, this is Crane's Court, which still exists. And right at the top of Crane's Court, and if I were to zoom right in on this map, you'd see that actually Royal Society House is marked on this map. This is where the Royal Society's original location was. This is, of course, where many of the great thinkers of the day and some of the more notorious gangs were hanging out in London. Some of the names of some of the venues that are referred to in huge amounts of literature are still legendary today. Names like the Devil's Tavern, Nando's Coffee House, and the Cheshire Cheese, which does still exist. Now, crucially for Benjamin, this is why it was such a shrewd move to locate here, because his business was, excuse me, my cursor disappeared. Uh, this green arrow points to approximately the location of where his publishing house would have been. Now, Benjamin turned his publishing house into the first publishers to specialise in natural history both in terms of publishing and selling books around the subject. So being almost opposite 
where the members of the Royal Society would have come out of Crane's Court onto Fleet Street, he would almost have been the first thing to catch their eye. And of course, this therefore would have attracted many people from that fantastic society through his doors. And those were people who were both looking to publish and could afford to buy books. Excellent location. Brilliant for Benjamin, but it would also have been an incredible boon to Gilbert, not just for recording wildlife. And we know that Gilbert did definitely go to Fleet Street because of passages like this in his journal. May 1st, 1785. The dust on the roads insufferable. Saw one swift, two house martins in Fleet Street. Now, you can take the man away from the natural history, but he'll still be looking for natural history wherever he is. And he's there clearly in Fleet Street recording swifts over the street. I'm afraid when I was there a few days ago, I didn't see any swifts flying over. But you never know, maybe they were just a little bit too high up for me. Now, unlike Thomas and Benjamin, Gilbert never joined the Royal Society. Presumably the fees were too far above what his income would have allowed and perhaps only being an infrequent visitor to the city, it just wasn't worth the expense. But through Benjamin's printing house, he was able to meet his most famous correspondents, Thomas Pennant, the author of British Zoology, and Daines Barrington, the vice president of the Royal Society, are of course embodied in Gilbert's book. It was at Barrington's request that White published two papers at the Royal Society's, um, in their Royal Society's journal, Philosophical Transactions, on his observations of behaviour of house martin swifts and swallows, which really paved the way for the publication of his book. At Benjamin's, he would have met many others who shaped both his way of thinking and the study of natural history. People like Sir Joseph Banks and Daniel Solander. Solander, of course, was Linnaeus's mouthpiece in London. He was promoting the Linnaean system of classification and nomenclature. And it's likely through exposure to this in London that Gilbert rapidly started to emulate Linnaean nomenclature in his journals and correspondence. And although he never corresponded with him himself, to recommend that his brother John in Gibraltar wrote to Linnaeus about his discoveries there. Of course, Gilbert's greatest legacy is his book, The Natural History and Antiquities of Selborne. Encouraged by friends, correspondents, families, perhaps emboldened by the success of his papers at the Royal Society. But it is, of course, Brother Benjamin who published that work in 1789 from Fleet Street in London, starting a record of publication that's still extant today. And of course, long may that continue. In conclusion, we do have to think what would Gilbert have been without London, without that opportunity for discussion and correspondence, and of course, without the opportunity to publish. Likelier, he would have been happier without the coach journeys and the gnats and flies of South Lambeth. But I do think that without Gilbert's London, we likely wouldn't be talking about Gilbert and Gilbert's Selborne today. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you found that interesting. Do please post any questions in the comments. I look forward to seeing um, and talking to you later on.